focus on some topic areas uh, from the government's perspective. And I'm, I'm sharing this information with you because I teach contracting officers, contracting officer representatives, and program managers. And, and I, I'm teaching them how to protect the taxpayer dollars and what kinds of things they have to do from a regulation point of view to be able to manage our contracts. I'm sharing this information with you because if you need to know their side of what they're looking for, it's going to help you be a better contractor. So most contractors don't get this knowledge and because they don't have any access to what the government's learning. But I wanted to share it with you so that we kind of give you an edge up. So the governments are concerned about risk. Um, you know, the sort of the standard line in D.C. is um, you don't want to end up on the front cover of the Washington Post because that means um, something's gone horribly wrong and um, now you're going to have to be, uh, they, they get dragged through the uh, mud in terms of trying to get uh, the work actually done and then they, they're embarrassed and usually there's a congressional oversight that happens and it just becomes a big pain for them. So um, they want to make sure that they minimize the risks as much as possible. So the first thing that they're concerned about is the type of um, requirements document involved. So are they just giving a straight commercial item description, in which case they've gone out and conducted market research and found companies that provide certain products and services and they, they're just using a commercial item description? Or are they trying to design where they're creating the requirements from scratch, maybe it's for a brand new Intel system? Uh, are they doing it based on performance, that you have to meet certain standards, like performance-based contracting we talked about? Or are they doing it based on functional requirements? Thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. So that's something that causes risk, right? Because in the case of functional requirements, if they're not right, then you're not going to produce the right thing, and then they're going to be responsible for financially fixing it. Uh, they're also concerned about the nature and complexity of the requirement. You know, um, writing requirements is very difficult. And I spend a lot of time with government officials just trying to write it in a way that makes sense to us. Because just like any of us, like if I asked you to uh, put together a requirements document, you have so much knowledge about your companies inside your head, and trying to, to distill it and figure out what you would actually need to write requirements about can be a very challenging. And oftentimes, oftentimes it's not one person writing these requirements. It's getting some from you and getting some from you and getting some, and you're all calling things different terms, it, and, and that causes confusion for contractors. So there's a whole lot of <coughs> reasons why government RFPs are not as clear and concise as we'd like them to be. Um, so that, that's part of the issue. The maturity requirement. Are we brand new trying to do something and we're starting from scratch, or is this a requirement that's been around for years and years and easy to deal with? Um, what's the quantity? You know, is, if, is this where we're doing a run of 100? or are we doing a run of a million? In which case, that's going to cause risk. Uh, what's the quality required? Um, you know, when we talked, I think, the first week about um, you know, when we talked the first week about the bell-shaped curve, and here's the this is the standard that the government is requiring. Um, how far off the standard? Remember we said if, if, if a product, if we were producing something, if it falls right here, it's perfect, right? But some of them are a little bit off this way, or some of them are a little bit off this way. What's the standard deviation away from the mean that the customer will accept? So for something like NASA, how flexible do you think they are with any of the tolerances for any of the parts of the space station? No, space station? Mm -hmm. no, tolerance. no tolerance, right? We're like at 99%, it's got to be perfect. 99.9%. So that's going to be, that the requirement there is going to be very close to where it is here, right? That's going to be, the, the, anything that falls within this very tight range is what they're, they're going to accept. But maybe for loan processing, where there's some more, um, you know, there's, uh, it's not life or death, uh, there are checks and balances in the system. You know, maybe they're more, a little bit more lenient, and they could say anything that occurs within these areas would be acceptable. So they have to figure out what their own acceptance rate is for what they'll, what they'll tolerate. So that's the quality issue. Um, their delivery schedule. You know, is this something that uh, 
you just deliver and they'll use as they need them, in which case there's some long lag time or lead time there? Or is this something that, you know, we're going to war tomorrow and we've got to have these things ready to be shipped? So that's going to drive the delivery schedule. Period of performance, you know, how long is this contract? Are we, are we, trying, to, are we trying to use up money where we have to use it by year end? Or is this something that's going to go multi-year funding that's going to go across many years? What's the stability of the technology? Is this something brand new we're talking about? So you can see how some of these, you can see how the FAR is written for all agencies, right? Because something like stability of the technology might be really critical in DOD and really critical in Intel, um, whereas some of these other things might just be specific to some of the civilian agencies. You can see how it goes across it. There's also market risks. So um, are they going to have, are we contractors going to have access to the resources we need to provide the products or services? So when the tsunami hit Japan, government panicked. Because what do, what do we produce a lot of in Japan? Electronics. Electronics and the computer chips, right? And when we can't get computer chips, we can't do the end products. So that's an, uh, a market risk. Trends in prices for labor, materials, equipment, et cetera. So, you know, in um, a lot of parts of the country right now, we're in an over surplus, I'm sorry, we have, we have, le we have less labor than the number of jobs to fill, right? So um, it's very much of a labor market right now. Um, other times, you know, people can't get jobs. Um, other risks are just inherent in doing business with uh, perspectives with, uh, with contractors. Um, you know, what's the probable level of competition? So, you know, when we, we're talking about, uh, oh, did we lose our, our um, He left a little early. Okay. Um, I was going to say, when he was talking about Job Corps, right, so there were some things you know, where he said there were some centers that were uh, contracted out and some centers that were federally owned, right? And so those federally owned ones, probably they couldn't get contractors to handle those piece, those particular centers. So that's level of competition. Uh, adequacy of our accounting, estimating, and management control systems. So we have to, I gave you the example yesterday where somebody didn't have a cost accounting system and they weren't allowed to buy anything for the government until they got the so they want to make sure that we're controlling the money as best as possible. Uh, what are relative capability and experiences? So, you know, are we really good with advances in technology or are we, you know, still using 286s on our desk, right? So that's going to give them a sense of how experienced we are with things. What are our performance records? You know, they can look at our past performance and see how we've done. Um, any changes in the level of business? In other words, are we in a boom or are we in a decline or are things pretty relative constant? You guys deal with that a lot with the whole coal mining thing, right? When times are, are when times are strong with coal mining, it, business is booming. When it's not, things tend to level off or, or decline. Uh, how much are we going to uh, subcontract? So you know, just like you all talk to each other from other companies. Oh yeah, this subcontractor was really good. Oh, don't touch this subcontractor because they're a pain in the neck. You're making those kind of decisions. They talk amongst themselves and make decisions as to whether or not they should be working with you. And then any concurrent contracts you have. So if you've just won three major contracts, the government's going to get nervous that you're not going to be able to provide them the support on this particular contract. Um, the other thing that has to happen is during contract performance, they're evaluating you for their past performance write-up. So they have to do a past performance write-up on you. And these are the kinds of things that they look at. Um, so let's we'll start out about it from two phases. When you submit a proposal to the government, you tell them about your past performance. And so you write up your contracts, the contracts that are similar in size and scope to what they're doing. And that's your word about what you've done. In addition to your word at the proposal submission, they can go to their internal systems and look up what other government officials have said about you through their past performance system. So that's one way that they evaluate past performance. Also, one, once you have the contract, they will now look at your work that you're doing every day and create a new past performance record on you for this particular work. And these are the kind of things they look at. You know, what's the quality of product and services? What's the timeliness of performance? Were you able to control costs and come in within budget? Uh, what are your business practices? 
are your end users satisfied? Um, how, how, have your past, how have your key personnel performed on this contract? So they're looking at this information to determine if you're a risk factor at proposal submission, whether they should even award the contract to you. And then after contract award, they're evaluating these aspects of you to alert other government officials on how you're doing. Um, sometimes they'll ask for surveys that are uh, answered by past customers to determine whether or not um, they're getting consistent, uh, reliable data. So if you were to go after a GSA schedule, for example, they would ask you to do this ORI report. And we talked about that. This would provide addresses and names for 6 to 20 of your customers. And they basically are pinging them and asking them to fill out a survey to see, like, overall, how do you guys perform? Because you can always have one customer that you probably, you know, maybe did some things wrong and they really rated you low. But if overall you're a good, solid contractor, that's what something like this is designed to do. Um, they can't share any source selection <coughs> information with, with any respondent. So if they call up their buddy, if you're applying for a contract with me in the Department of Energy, and I know that you just did some work at HHS, and I say, oh, I'm going to call my buddy over at HHS and find out how you did, the HHS contracting officer can tell me verbally stuff here that maybe they didn't feel comfortable about putting in a report, but it, they'll talk to me about it. But I can't say to them, company ABC is in the lead right now because I can't provide any source selection information outside the source selection. And then they have to document this, this past performance evaluation and then they put it up into the systems. Um, other things they look at, any kind of deficiency, the number and severity of any deficiency in relation to the overall record. You know, one thing contractors complain about is, I had perfect performance, I had one day, the report was due the next day, and I got nailed, right? It, it wasn't an overall view of how I performed, but we're humans, and we tend to think about the last bad thing that happened. Um, age and relevance of past performance information. Did you have a problem seven years ago, but you haven't had any problems since? Never look at that. Um, is there any bias on the part of any given customer? So, um, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, I always like working with Booz Allen. Everybody knows I always like working with Booz Allen. So anything you ask me about Booz Allen, I'm going to tell you is great. You know, so there's internal human bias. Uh, the extent to which poor performance has been more the fault of the customer instead of uh, the contractor. So let's say, for example, they say, oh, the contractor really performed poorly in the month of December of 2018. Well, we would say, how did you expect the contractor to perform because we were under sequestration and uh, the government's closed, right? So that's not the contractor's fault. That's the government's fault. So that would be an example there. How, what kind of measures did you take to correct past problems? You know, um, if you got hit on this one contract that said you didn't have um, you had too many products that were defects, and in your next one you put together a whole quality management plan and you, put, you know, started doing ISO um, 9000, now they're going to say, okay, well, they've taken corrective steps to fix this problem that haven't been fixed. Um, Survey-related biases. So sometimes, uh, sometimes people don't like to be critical. So even though you did a lousy job, oh yeah, yeah, they did great, 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 because they don't want you to come back and question them, and they don't want to have to explain themselves and get into a whole big thing with you, so they uh, take it from that perspective. So that's what we call handle bias. Remember I talked about um, contractor responsibility? Uh, these are the kinds of things they look at. Um, met or can meet at the time of award any special standards for all the requirements. Um, that you have adequate financial resources to perform the contract. For example, if they read the paper and they see that your company has just filed for ch Chapter 11 bankruptcy, it's not going to be a good day in the procurement department. Um, the ability to comply with the delivery and performance schedule, if you have a satisfactory performance record with your other customers, uh, that you have a solid record of integrity. You know, if they start hauling your CEO off to prison and it's on the front page of the Washington Post, that too is not going to go well. Um, necessary organization, expertise, controls, and skills. I'll give you an example. One time we were, uh, I was with BDX, and we were working with McDonnell Douglas as a subcontractor. And we were, we were working with a 
particular division of um, McDonnell Douglas called Mean Graphics. So this was their computer aided design uh, group. And um, the day before we submitted our proposal, it came out on all the papers that EDS had bought Mean Graphics. So right away, the government, uh, we were going to turn in our proposal as it had been written, where Unigraphics was a subcontractor, but immediately the government started sending us questions. How are you going to manage this relationship? How is this all going to work? So they asked us for some things that we now had to include in the proposal to be able to explain how we were going to handle the situation. Of course, our company didn't see a need to share with those of us working on the proposal that we were buying it, so you know we were kind of caught with, because you know, of course you can't because of stakeholder and SEC violations, but it was a, it was a um, that you have all the necessary controls and skills, production, construction, technical facilities, and that you need all. So those are the kinds of things they're looking at you when they're trying to determine whether or not you're responsible. Um, the next thing they do is uh, they could decide to come in and conduct a pre-award survey. So when they conduct a pre-award survey, typically it's because they don't know you and they give you a um, list of things that they want to see about you. And so they come to your facility and they're trying to understand your capability to perform on this contract. So, um, you know, as more and more data becomes available online, they're minimizing their reasons for coming. The travel budgets is another reason for uh, minimizing their attempts for sites visits. Maybe they'll just ask you online. Um, through email to send them certain documents. But basically, they're trying to figure out whether or not you have what you say you have. Remember I gave you the example where we used to always say we were the premier systems integrator because we had integrated the Navy and General Motors and all these other things, where this you know, three-person engineering firm was also saying they were a premier systems integrator. I mean, they didn't have anywhere near the past performance to be able to support that. That's what they were looking for. They also have to check on you to figure out whether or not you've ever been debarred, suspended, or ineligible for contract award. So if, if you ever had a situation where you committed fraud um, and you were debarred, or maybe you were you, you, um, you don't have a good cost accounting system and they said, okay, you're suspended for six months. All that information is reported in the SAM system, um, and the government before they would make any award to you, would go look at that suspended and debarred list to see if you were on it. If you were on it, you would be deemed ineligible for the award. Um, if you're doing just straight commercial items, or if you're doing just a simplified acquisition, typically they don't come out and investigate you because if you're, or conduct a survey, because they make the determination. If you're selling stuff day to day in the commercial marketplace, you probably are good to go. Any questions about career awards for um, <coughs> I mentioned this yesterday when I said that I just come from a kickoff meeting. So there's two different meetings that happen. The kickoff meeting um, happens with the winning contractor, and then these debriefings occur with all the losing contractors. So once you receive notice of the contract award, um, if you lose, you have 10 days within which you have to ask for a debrief. And during that time, so if you ask, they have to provide you a debrief. Now, if you wait till day 11, there's no requirement for them to do this. And so basically what they do is you either come in or they do it over the phone, and um, they, they're very scripted in what they can say to you. And the reason why they're scripted is because you're still within that protest period. But they have to show you the evaluation criteria they used and how you scored against each of those evaluation criteria. They won't tell you how you scored against the winning proposal, and they won't tell you any other information other than the evaluation criteria and how you stacked up against it. And they're doing that to not give you any fodder for you to use to launch a protest. So they have to be very scripted. Usually they have their attorney there um, during these meetings so that they have to say. Uh, so, okay, I, I lied. It's within three days after receiving notice that you've been um,